Thank you, Deborah. That's a very kind introduction. I am really deeply honored to be here, and thank you for inviting me, particularly on this very important occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Brazilian Academies of Science. So I'm really, other than the hour, I'm really glad that all of those people uh, who talked about education preceded me, including Dr. Albertson and the folks in the last uh, session. What I want to do is to talk about how the learning sciences and build upon what Dr. Harlan has said, how the learning sciences can improve the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, and, and mathematics, STEM. Now, somebody once said, the only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. <laughs> now, this is not just somebody or anybody. This is somebody pretty important. And what he is getting at is the kind of education that we now offer that you've heard so much about, both in Brazil and other parts of the world, really can interfere with deep learning by people. Okay? We're going to come back to Albert a little bit later. So <clears throat> what I want to talk to you about is a whole series of reports, but very, very briefly on some of these, and also give you an opportunity to experience the kinds of evidence that people have created in understanding the learning sciences and how they influence or should be influencing what we're doing in schools. This is a report that came out in 2000 called Talking About Leaving, Why Undergraduates Leave the Sciences. We're going to be talking mostly about undergraduate education during this presentation. This is really an important study and it's actually being replicated right now and being sponsored by the U.S. National Science Foundation. What this report said is not only what we heard before that, that students don't really want to be scientists, so we don't get as many people coming to college as we would like. But once they're there, especially in the United States, and I am assuming here too, we lose an awful lot of them. The people who say that they want to be science, engineering, or mathematics, or technology majors when they come to college, by the time they finish their first college courses in whatever subject they're interested in, about 60% of them leave. They transfer out to other kinds of things. Now, this report started looking at what's the reason for that. Part of it might be some students will say, well, you know, I had to work really hard and late at night and in the labs, and my friend who's in some other subject not related to science was out at the bar drinking and all of it, and that's not what I want to do. But that's not what most students said. Most students said, what happened in those introductory courses doesn't speak to me. Nothing that I've heard is relevant. I'm learning a whole lot of facts. Nobody's connecting the facts. Nobody's helping me understand what they mean. It makes no sense. If this is what science or engineering is like, it's not for me. Okay? Now, you can rationalize that these students probably should have been weeded out anyway, right? They never would have made it. But if you look at two different pieces of data, that's not what it says at all. If you look and compare the transcripts from high school of the people who stayed in science and the people who left, if you look at their grade point averages and their letters of recommendation, statistically there is no difference between the people who stay and the people who leave. Okay? And secondly, most of the students who were leaving passed the introductory course. So it's not that they were failing out and they, therefore they had bad feelings about it. They're leaving for other reasons. Now, we've changed a lot over the time since this report has been produced in 2000, in the last 16 years. Now we're trying to find out has it made any difference. Okay, stay tuned. All right. Now, there are a couple of <clears throat> recent Academy reports. Dr. Alberts talked to you about the fact <clears throat> that there are close to 6,000 Academy reports that you can download for free at nap.edu, and we have about 600 reports in um, education. I'm just going to focus on a couple of them in this talk. The first one that you should know about, particularly for undergraduate education, is something that's published in 2012 called Discipline-Based Education Research. Understanding and Improving Learning in Undergraduate Science and Engineering. Download it for free. This report is based upon this one. The first one was a very technical report. The second one is designed for faculty in colleges and universities to help them understand what the research is saying and ultimately how they can translate it into what they do in their classroom experiences. 
And both of these reports and many, many other reports that we have at the academies are based upon this report that was originally published in 2000 and we're now in the process of updating with, since we've had so much more data called How People Learn Brain, Mind, Experience, and School. And again, you can download all of these. So what I want to do is to actually lead you through some of the things that How People Learn has taught us and how it's being represented in these much more recent publications. And I want to try to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that the learning sciences are telling us because what we know now about human learning is pretty distressing given the ways that we actually teach and ask students to learn. It's not based upon that kind of knowledge. And indeed, um, Deborah pointed out I was a faculty member for, at the college level for 18 years. I had my PhD in biology. I never even knew this literature existed. Right? And here we are influencing students' brains. And we don't know for the most part, how it works. Okay? Now, in addition to the academies, there are a whole lot of other reports about a process called active learning, which is one of the ways that you get at what Professor Harlan was talking about, inquiry-based science. And if you look at the number of papers, and the list is actually far longer, of the effectiveness of active learning versus the effectiveness of just straight lectures, okay? nothing but talking at people, you can see that there is a very large difference. Indeed, Carl Wyman, the Nobel laureate physicist who's now at Stanford University and who has devoted much of his career now to improving science education, as Dr. Alberts has, contends that there are now over 1,500, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 research peer-reviewed papers talking about the effectiveness of active learning. It's not a question anymore. Okay. Here is another one that if you're reading nothing else, I would suggest that you take a look at, which is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in April 2014. And this is by Scott Freeman and his colleagues. And <clears throat> you can download again. And the part that's in yellow, what I want to do is to emphasize that. And it's, here's what it says. These results indicate that average examination scores improved by about 6% in active learning sections of classes. They, inter they looked at more than 250 papers and did a meta-analysis. And that students in classes with traditional lecturing were about 1.5 times more likely to fail their courses than were students in classes with active learning. These are very, very powerful, robust data published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Thank you, Dr. Alberts, for sending this to me. Okay. So what I want to talk about, and we're We'll go through this fairly quickly. Normally what I try to do in these kinds of presentations is to engage you in active learning, but to give you a feel for how it works. But it's a little bit late, we're kind of tired. So I will do more of what I'm arguing against, and that's more traditional lecturing, okay? So our objectives for this, se this session are four. First is to understand how to build both a deep foundation of factual knowledge and a strong conceptual framework. This is what how People Learn talks about of moving students from being novices in something to experts in something. The second thing is to briefly explore how transfer of, no uh, explore transfer of knowledge and actually how difficult it is to do. It's really hard for people to be able to take one thing and relate it to something else without practice. You can't just tell them about it, and we'll give you an example. The third thing is to address learners' preconceptions and misconceptions, as was talked about Students don't come to your classrooms as blank slates. They've created knowledge, they've developed knowledge from experience, from learning in school, and they come with a lot of different kinds of ideas. Very many of them are not conducive to what we know from scientific reality, so we'll talk about that. And then we also want to consider very quickly how pedagogy can utilize principles of learning to improve how we begin to think about teaching and learning at the undergraduate level. Okay. So, we're going to move away from science and we're going to talk about chess for a minute as we think about conceptual learning. And here's the chessboard challenge. It's a classic experiment that was done. All right? Here is a board with chess pieces on it. And what was happened is that there were a group of three different people who were asked to look at it. One were master chess players, world-class master chess players. Another group were called Class A. They were very good, 
but not quite at the level of master. And the third were novices. They've never actually played chess, or they played a little bit, but really aren't very good at all. Okay, so they were lo looked at this board. They had a chance to study it for about 10 to 15 seconds. Then all the pieces were taken off, and they were asked to recreate the board. All right? And after they did that, all the pieces were taken off. They were shown the board again. The pieces were taken off, and they were asked to recreate the board. And they did this over a series of trials. Okay? So the question is, can you correctly place the, the chess pieces? And so what we have on the x-axis here are the trial numbers, trials one through seven of that repetitive process of letting people see the board, removing them, and asking them to replace it. And then on the y-axis, the number of pieces that they correctly recalled. Now, normally what I would do is ask you to talk among your neighbors and come up with a graph of what those three different groups of people, the masters, class A, and beginners would do. But I'll just show you the answer at this point. I don't think you're probably too surprised by that, right? So <clears throat> the red masters, they start at a much higher level than class A or a beginner. And over enough time, the, the masters pretty much are at the top and the asymptote and the others come up, okay? So that was that board that they kept being shown. Now, another group of master players, class A and, and beginners, were shown a different board, okay? Same number of pieces, just put in different places. And they were asked to do the, exactly the same thing. And here were the results. Okay, now the question is, why? So here are the two boards. You can see, same pieces, just different positions. How in the world can that make a difference? And here are the results again, just so that you can compare. We can spend a lot of time, we don't have time, to think about your hypotheses. But basically what's going on here, when you look at the difference between board one and board two, board one is set up, the pieces are set up as a game was being played. Okay, so the master chess players and class A players could see the logic of the game. They've been able, they were able to think in their minds about what the steps were that, and the moves were that preceded this. The novices had no idea at all, they just memorized and, and put it up. The second board, in contrast, the pieces were arranged randomly. So now the masters lost their advantage. They could no longer figure out the logic of the game and use all of the additional skills besides just the information they were given. And so they did no better than the class A or the, the novices. So what this is showing us is that the amount of information that's available, basically anybody can learn it. But the difference between a novice and an expert is that experts are able to take this information and they use it and they store it and apply it in very different ways. They have a rich knowledge base, but rather than just having the rich knowledge base, it's organized in many different ways. They can figure things out, they can look at it from different dimensions, okay? And they notice and remember large amounts of complex information in their domain of expertise after short exposures to a new situation. So again, if you gave them another board, that was in play, they would be able to figure that out much faster than a novice. So what this is showing is that content by itself, you, you have to know something. I mean, everybody learned. Content is necessary, but it's far from sufficient. And to build expertise in almost any field, be it chess or almost anything else, you have to help people move from basic knowledge to what you do with that knowledge and how you organize the knowledge. And far too often, particularly in undergraduate education with large survey courses like this, what we find is that we focus primarily on the knowledge itself rather than how to organize the knowledge and how to connect it with other kinds of things because we have to cover so much material. A person I respect very much told me that the hallmark of the effective educator is not how much he or she covers but how much he or she uncovers, okay? And so we have to think about this. Now, the same kinds of things can be demonstrated in other fields. If you take an electrical engineer, for example, and instead of showing them chess boards, you show them a schematic 
of some, some instrument like an amplifier and you take away the components and ask them to replace it, they can replace it as long as it was shown in a logical fashion that they saw as some kind of an instrument. If you show them exactly the same pieces, but it's arranged in a, in a random fashion, they're really no better than others. And what we're seeing is that in domain after domain after domain, this is the same kind of thing. Experts are able to see things, see exactly the same information, but in a very different way. Are we doing enough to help our students achieve that kind of expertise? Okay, here's another example. What is this thing? Take a look at it for a minute. It's kind of hard. And again, I'd spend a little more time, but we don't have a lot of time. It's this. All right? Now, the problem is that in too many classes, and I was at fault at this being a biology professor before I really understood any of this, we tend to teach at this level. We tend to help people see the different parts, but we don't help them see how it's put together. Is it easier to look at the parts and understand their relationships without seeing how they're put together or after you've seen how they've been put together? Okay? And particularly in, in things like biology, remember that some of those pieces are like this. Other pieces are like that. But they're all shown on this parts list as essentially the same thing. We don't help our students to understand how much smaller bacterial cells are, for example, than eukaryotic cells. The books all show them about the same thing. They have these little markers on them, but it's not internalized. Okay, here's another one. I took this picture, so I just want to... What's that? Yeah, a whole bunch of very pretty eggs. But when you look at the whole pattern, you see... So again, you can look at the details, but the whole picture is really what helps you to understand in a deeper way what it is that we're talking about and what the context is. But we too often do not provide that kind of deeper context, this conceptual framework upon which you can take knowledge and do something with it. Okay, and here's one more, just, just to plant the seeds. If we were doing this, I'd tell you to take out a piece of paper and pencil. Here's a, a <clears throat> Five, uh, excuse me, one through eight, uh, one through nine, with all of these different symbols. Now I would take it away, and I would ask you to draw the shapes associated with the individual numbers. Okay, I didn't give you enough time, but if I did, what I, most people would may be able to get one. A couple of people might be able to get two. Very few people would get all four. But <clears throat> here they are. In abstract, doesn't mean anything. But what if I gave you the conceptual framework first? Take a look at your cell phone. Does it make more sense now? Right. Okay. So what, again, how people learn, the, the kinds of learning research that's going on is helping us to understand how knowledge is organized. And for the most part, we tend not to do a very good job of helping students organize this knowledge. Okay. Now, seeing the framework in the material, uh, sorry, I'm going to, that was in the wrong. So, what we need to be thinking about is building both factual knowledge, the knowledge can be arranged in all kinds of ways, as well as the conceptual framework. Okay. Now, let's think about transfer of knowledge for a minute. We've got this knowledge, what do we do with it, and how do we relate it to other kinds of things? What, we net, what research is telling us is that it's really difficult to do. And yet, we make this point, and we make that point, and we make that point, and then we ask the students to put it all together on the final exam, and then we're outraged when they can't do it. But what learning research is telling us is it's normal that they can't do it. So let me give you an example. Okay. The more one knows about a topic, the easier it is to learn more about that particular topic. And transfer can be facilitated by knowing multiple contexts under which an idea applies, although rote learning rarely transfers, but expertise in one domain does not necessarily transfer to other, idea, uh, other areas. So wisdom itself, as Dr. Harlan was talking about, can't be taught directly, and instruction must be directed towards the gradual acquisition 
of understanding and expertise. Here's the example. Undergraduates were shown this problem. They were tested on it to see, be sure that they understood it. And because of, of language issues, let me just read it to you quickly. A general wishes to capture a fortress in the center of a country. There are many roads radiating outward from the fortress. All roads have been mined so that while small groups of soldiers can pass over the road safely, a large force will detonate the mines. A full-scale direct attack is therefore impossible. The general solution is to divide the army into small groups, send each to the head of a different road, and have the groups converge simultaneously on the fortress. Does that make sense? Okay, now the students were tested to be sure that it made sense to them, and they answered a number of questions, and they did all very well. Short time later, they were shown this problem. You're a doctor faced with a patient who has a malignant tumor in the stomach. It's impossible to operate on the patient, but unless the tumor is destroyed, the patient will die. There is a kind of ray that may be used to destroy the tumor. If the rays reach the tumor all at once and with sufficient high energy, high intensity, the damage and the tumor will be destroyed, but surrounding tissue may be damaged as well. At lower intensities, the rays are harmless to healthy tissue, but they will not affect the tumor either. What type of procedure might be used to destroy the tumor with the rays and at the same time avoid destroying the healthy tissue? See a connection? After undergraduates were shown the first problem about the general and then were shown this and asked to get, come up with an answer, remember the other one gave them the answer, most undergraduates couldn't do it. But if they were told to use the information from the first problem, then more than 90% of them were able to solve it. So even though it seems obvious, it sounds this is the kind of thing that we now do on, with tumor therapy, right, of having multiple rays, gamma rays, et cetera. So the point is that it's really difficult to take information from one domain and transfer it to another. And unless we help students actually do this, then it's not likely to be successful. But again, what we do is we ask students to go to chemistry and biology and physics, and we all talk about something like energy, but we talk about it at different times. We use the same words to mean different things. We use the, the different words to mean the same thing. And then at the end, we ask them to put it all together on a final exam, and many students can't do it, and we think they're really stupid, <laughs> right? But they're not stupid. This is just a normal part of human development and what learning, is, uh, learning research is telling us students are able to do and not able to do and how practice and guided instruction can begin to help. Okay? So the implications for these last two things that we talked about. Being an expert in a topic does not imply that you'll also be effective in teaching that topic. You may have a lot of knowledge, and this particularly happens in K-12, in, in, in pre-college. At least in the United States, we've had these cases where we needed more science teachers, and so we tried to bring in engineers, and we tried to bring in other people who were unemployed to teach in the schools. And for the most part, they were, it, they were dismal failures because they had the content knowledge, but they had no idea how to make it available to students in third grade, to eight-year-olds. Okay? So expertise in teaching that topic is also needed. And this gets back to what Dr. Alberts was saying. What is the role of science and engineering faculty in educating the next generation of teachers? Okay? Whose responsibility is it? And do the ways that we teach and ultimately the ways that they end up teaching promote or hinder science learning? Okay? Teaching the content of a discipline without helping learners to organize that content is not optimal. And particularly in subjects like chemistry and physics, but to some extent in biology and others, procedures and equations used to solve problems in science and math are important, but also important are the underlying principles and concepts of these equations and how and where they can be applied. And too often, 
we allow students to go through the operations of doing the equations without understanding this. And this, this research came to light in the 1980s in physics when a professor at Arizona State University developed something called the force concept inventory. In the United States, pretty much every introductory course in physics is, is pretty much the same no matter which school you go to. And so what he did was to take all of the concepts that were usually done through mathematical equations and turn them into words to see whether students really understood the concepts. And for the most part, they didn't. They failed miserably on that test. Now, somebody from Harvard by the name of Eric Mazur said, well, that's just those students in, in Arizona State University. My students certainly will do better. And so he took all of his A students in, in his introductory physics course at Harvard University and gave them the test, and what did they do? They failed miserably, right? And so he began to think very, very differently about what faculty need to be doing. And although I don't have a picture of it, you may want to Google and take a look at a book that he wrote called Peer Instruction, which is all about his revelations from having his Harvard students, the, the best students in the world, right? Harvard keeps telling us that. Um, you know, to, to, who couldn't do this, okay? Now, one other problem is that new learning depends upon previous learning, and previous learning often interferes with what an instructor may be trying to teach. And these are sometimes called preconceptions or misconceptions or other conceptions. And very often they're just based upon human experience. Okay, so what I want to do is to give you Let's go into children's literature since the hour is late. And I want to talk to you a little bit about a children's novel called Fish is Fish by Leon Leone. And the story is that this fish grew up in this pond with a young frog, a tadpole. And the tadpole then changed to the adult form of the frog and left the pond and came back to tell his friend, the fish, about all the wonderful things that he'd seen. That fish, that fish just simply can't see. So what he said is that I saw these things with beautiful feathers, and they fly all over the place, and they build nests, and they're called birds. And the fish had never seen a bird, but here's the way, that, based upon the, the frog's description, it imagined birds. <laughs> and <clears throat> The frog said, and I saw these big, big things that have horns, and they have these weird things sticking out underneath their legs called udders, and they're called cows, and people eat them. And here's the way the fish thought about the cow. And finally, I saw these weird creatures that are walking on two legs, and they don't just have fur or bare skin like you do. They wear clothes, things called clothes, and they look really strange, and they're called people. And here's... <laughs> now, so what's going on here? It's really instructive, because what's going on is that the fish is using its own experience, taking new information, and now trying to filter it into what it already knows. And obviously, it's wrong. And this happens all the time when we have students coming to us after they've had their own kinds of experiences. So here are some examples. Young children who believe that the earth is flat. You ask them to draw themselves on something and they'll show it on a, uh, on a flat piece of paper. And you say, no, the world's really round, do that. So they'll draw a circle and put themselves on the top of the circle, but the whole thing still is flat. In other words, it's just a, a planar thing. You say, well, no, that's not really the case. It's really more like a basketball or a soccer ball, okay, football. And so now they draw this, but then what they do is they put a flat thing on the top and they stick themselves on it, <laughs> right? Okay, now <clears throat> students, when you throw a ball into the air, there are a whole lot of things that are going on, but many students have the idea that once you let go of the ball, the force of, of your hand is still somehow involved rather than gravitation and all the other kinds of things. There are biology students who believe that evolution occurred in the past, but isn't occurring now. And part of that is because we, in a lot of the ways that we teach evolution, it's all by fossils, right? And talking about dinosaurs and things. And then people's beliefs about the seasons, the distance that they believe that the reason that it's hot in the summer and cold in the winter is that the earth is closer to the sun in the summer than it is in the winter. 
And lest you think that this is an issue that, that people who are not very well educated, let me go back to Harvard again for a second. <laughs> and I want to show you a video, of about five minutes of a 20-minute video <clears throat> that you should really take a look at from something called a private universe, which was produced by Annenberg Learning through the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Okay, and it will be self-explanatory. And this then goes on afterwards to talk about the kinds of ways that younger students develop their ideas about why it's warmer in the summer and also the phases of the moon. Okay, so let's go here. Could you just turn that on, please? Candidate in art. Despite a lifetime of the very best education, students in our classrooms are failing to learn science. Many of these students will graduate from college with the same scientific misconceptions that they had on entering grade school. To test how a lifetime of education affects our understanding of science, we asked these recent graduates some simple questions in astronomy. Consider, for example, that the causes of the seasons is a topic taught in every standard curriculum. Okay, I think the seasons happen because as the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather. And, then, and hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun <laughs> and, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun and it gets colder when we get further away from the sun. These graduates, like many of us, think of the Earth's orbit as a highly exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. I took uh, physics, and planetary motion, and relativity, and electromagnetism, and waves. I've never really had a scientific background whatsoever, and I, and I got through school without having it. I've gotten very far without having it. I had uh, a, quite a bit of science in high school, yeah, uh, through uh, physics, one, first year, and two years of chemistry. Regardless of their science education, 21 of the 23 randomly selected students, faculty, and alumni of Harvard University revealed misconceptions when asked to explain either the seasons or the phases of the moon. When it's further away from um, the sun, then it gets colder. The Earth's position interferes with the reflection of the sun against the moon. That's 1944. So, you can see. Now, when you think about it, it makes sense. If you put your hand near a hot stove, it feels hot. Hopefully you don't put your hand on the stove. And then as you move it away, it feels cooler and cooler. That's a very, very logical kind of thing that students from experience have brought with them. And despite the courses that they've taken in science, still carry this, this misconception, this belief. And it's very, very difficult to dislodge. I taught, before I came to the National Academy of Sciences, at a college in Maine where it's cold, okay? It's cold all the time. And when I asked students about this, they also said it's colder in, in winter than in, in summer because the Earth is further away, or hotter in the summer because Earth, uh, the sun is closer to the Earth. Then I said, well, now think about this. We had a January semester for three, three weeks. It's really cold in, in Maine in January, but some of their friends went to Australia, and they were sending, back at the time, postcards and pictures of them in bathing suits. How can it, they show bathing suits in January? It's the same January. The Earth is not really that much further away in, 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 in Australia than it is. So the point is that you, have to, you can't just tell people you're wrong and give them this because these kinds of beliefs are very, very difficult to dislodge, 
all right? What you have to do is help students think their way through the issue and realize that what they just said really doesn't make sense, okay? And once you get that, once you get past that point that everything I thought really doesn't make sense, although it made perfect sense before to me, you can begin to make progress. But simply by telling students and giving them that information, watch this, this video and many others that have been produced, it's really difficult to dislodge that kind of information. And if you don't know it, when they come to your class, then it's really difficult to help students learn about a whole lot of different things. And there are all kinds of concept, in, 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 uh, concept indices in physics, in biology, in chemistry, in a lot of others. You may look them up on, on the web. Give them to your students and see what, what they do. Okay? The last part that I want to do is to think about the science of learning. And here is an experiment that was done um, <clears throat> that's published in this book in 2009 called The New Science of Teaching and Learning Using the Best of Mind, Brain, and Education. All right, now, in this case, what happened is that students were asked to learn some information, and they did it in a number of different ways. Some students, group, these were undergraduates, learn this through audio-visual techniques. They were shown a film or it maybe went online or something like that. In other cases, the concept was demonstrated to them. In other cases, they discussed it with their, their faculty member or with other students. In other cases, they sat like you're sitting, listening to me pontificate, and they just learned it through the information by straight lecture. Others did it by having to actually do something, manipulate something, practice something, okay? Others did it by reading about it. And others had to actually take what they had learned and teach it to somebody else, another student, okay? So you can see that there are very, very different levels of engagement here, from sitting passively to actually being able to tell somebody else. Now, the question that we had is that if you look, and I would have asked you to, to, to actually do this, what you see is that if you look at the average retention rate of that information, and you look at the different levels, what you see is that the highest level of retention occurs when students are actively doing something. The highest level is actually teaching to somebody else. You have to know it in order to be able to and organize it in ways to be able to teach somebody else. Others were practicing, and then as you went down to more and more passive things, less and less information was retained. And yet, at least in the United States, the typical still format for teaching large numbers of students is the 50-minute lecture, okay? And what we know is that students retain somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the information that they get from that lecture. Now, this is not to say that you should give up lecturing. There are different ways that you can begin to do this, and the research is helping us understand that you break up lectures. You do various kinds of things in addition to just talking at people. You get them to engage. You get them to work with their neighbors. You get them to vote with automatic uh, clicker systems on questions. And these kinds of techniques can begin to engage students. Physicists have demonstrated, if you do the experiment, in the classic experiment, I have a bowling ball here that's on a rope tied to the ceiling, and I'm gonna let it go, right? So it's a pendulum, and then it's gonna come back. <clears throat> you can tell students what's gonna happen, that remember, the, it's gonna lose energy as a result and will never actually hit the person back in the nose again, or you can ask them to bet on what the outcome will be. Will the professor get knocked off the seat that he or she is sta sitting in or standing in before they release it, or will something else happen? As, once you get students to at least buy in and come up with a hypothesis, they then become much more engaged. Because a lot of times when you ask students after a demonstration, they say, yeah, that was really neat. And you ask them, what's it about? And they say, I have no idea. <laughs> but if you ask them to actually become involved, actively involved through that kind of discovery-based inquiry that we heard about, then you increase learning a lot. Okay? Now, this says, I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. <laughs> so if we're going to begin to do this kind of thing, we as faculty also have to think differently about the ways that we 
interact with students. Faculty have for too long been the sages on the stage. We impart knowledge to other people. They take what we know and they incorporate it into themselves. Some people have said that a co typical college lecture is something that is passed from the notebook of the faculty member to the notebook of the students without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> okay? So this requires a different kind of thinking on our part also as faculty that if we want people to be independent, we have to give them the opportunity to be independent thinkers. We have to give them the kind of problems that encourage them to be these kinds of independent thinkers. And we also have to revise and rethink what our role is rather than being a sage on the stage to a coach, to a facilitator, to somebody who helps people make sense of information, particularly when that information is available on the internet 24-7. All right. Now the problem is, when I was a graduate student, I went to the library and I took out a book and I had some idea that somebody vetted it, right? That it was in there for a reason. But you can go to the internet now and click on evolution, for example, and half the things that come up are creationist websites. So now students have very different kinds of problems and challenges. How do we help them understand what's valid information? How do we help them make sense of the kinds of things that they are facing in their world? That requires a different approach to thinking. It's something to think about, and there's a lot of research that, that's been talking about this, including some of the reports that I mentioned to you before. So in closing, uh, we saw this <clears throat> um, comment from Albert Einstein before. Here's one more from him. Education is what remains after one has forgotten everything he learned in school. Are we helping students develop the kinds of habits of mind that we've heard about before that will engage them as active learners that are involved in their own learning through the kinds of teaching that we do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jay, for excellent and very funny thank talk. You. So we have time for one question. Really sorry about that. I can stay for a minute afterwards, too, a couple minutes. Who is it? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Jeremy McNeil from Canada. Um, I've tried this. I just have a question for you. When you ask a group of students, well, what do you think? And they all put their head down. How do you start? Because they're so used to sitting in classrooms and just listening, yeah. that they feel pointed out, and then they all sort of do turtle on you. You, you ask a very good question, and remember that this, again, with, like with preconceptions and misconceptions, students have been through your, the education system for a long time before they get to college. And they have been reinforced, in many ways, for number one, being given the answer, or being given the information, and number two, for taking the kinds of assessments that, that Dr. Harlan talked about, that are very easy, low cognitive skills, and they've excelled. That's the way they see the system. What we're asking is a change in paradigm, all right? And so part of this requires, number one, finding problems that students are actually interested in. We did a report, one of the report, earliest reports I did at the, the academy, for example, had this modest title of transforming undergraduate education, okay? And one of the things that this report <clears throat> said at the time is that too often we think about these culminating experiences, you know, where you take all the courses work that you've had and now in your senior year you put it all together and now you, you are in fully engaged intellectually. The problem is for 90% of students they never get past the introductory courses. So what would happen instead of having biology 101 or chemistry 101 if we had something like breast cancer 101 as an introductory course? For better or for worse, everybody unfortunately knows somebody who is currently suffering from or has suffered from breast cancer. You have immediate buy-in to want to know something about this. In that introductory course, we could begin to teach about the genetics, the biochemistry of cancer, the epidemiology of cancer, the statistics that are involved in how we calculate this, so there is some math. We can begin to talk about prostheses and these sorts of things that involve engineering. We can talk about ethics. You begin to pull together in this introductory course all of these different areas 
about <clears throat> cancer in this case. So if a student says, I want to cure cancer, now they might have a good reason to understand that if they want to become a biochemist, they need to know something about these topics, rather than having you say, having them come all the time and say, why do I need to know this? Right? How many times have we, said, have we heard that? And if you can't give a good answer for why they need to know it, maybe you shouldn't be talking about it. Maybe you shouldn't be covering it. So it requires a different way of thinking about these things, and it also requires getting students engaged in their own learning. Part of this is through questions and issues that are important to them. And so part, one of the things that I used to do, particularly for my upper level courses, I would say, you aren't required to be here. Why are you here? What do you want to learn? Okay. The other thing is helping people understand that science is so important. I taught a course in human physiology where half the course were second semester seniors because they just couldn't put it off any longer to take a science course with, so they could graduate. So they came to my course and I would say on the first day, let's understand each other. You think you're here because you have to take a course to get out of here. Let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here to convince you by the time that you leave this course that it will be the most important course that you've ever taken at this college. Because you will learn things about your body so that you can make more informed decisions about things that are inevitably going to happen to you and your family. And at a minimum, you're not going to be sold a bunch of snake oil by people who are trying to con you. Not, you'll be more skeptical. Let's get started. And at the end of the semester, it was always kind of heartbreaking, but when I had second semester seniors telling me, if I'd known biology could be like this, I might have majored in it. Right? It's a very different way of thinking about things. We think about systems and how they put together, not all of the, the minutia. The minutia can come after you, they begin to see the bigger picture, but they also have to know why it's important to them. And very often, we don't help. It takes two minutes at the beginning of a class at the beginning of a semester to let people understand, why am I doing this? Why am I here? Why am I, how am I planning to help you? And why is this important? If we just simply move into here's the syllabus, here's how you're going to be tested, and now let's get started. And we talk about all of the content without the other kinds of things that we've mentioned here today. I can understand why students are pretty disengaged and they won't listen.